ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. I'm Richard Dalton, and I shall chair this session. Well, on a day when the British celebrate the discovery of the remains of a king killed in 1485, whose body was, we thought, disappeared for centuries, maybe we should believe that the solution of every riddle, of every problem, uh, can be achieved with diligence and imagination. We have uh, two speakers today to contribute thoughts on the kind of diligence and the kind of imagination uh, that should be used. It, it's now almost certain that there will be talks starting on the 25th of February in Kazakhstan that the drought in at least talking about negotiations that has lasted since the final round in June 2012, with one or two small exceptions, but that drought is now uh, finally going to break. But it's even less clear now than at other times whether both parties will bring fresh ideas and will bring imagination uh, to the task. I'm going to ask Dr. Patricia Lewis to open the uh, proceedings. Uh, she, as you know, is director of the international security program here at Chatham House with a background in nuclear physics and arms control. She has published widely on all aspects of arms control and disarmament and we're lucky to have her to set the technical scene for this negotiation. Patricia. Thank you indeed Richard. Thank you very much and it's a, a great pleasure um, to have with us um, Syed Hussain Musavian. Um, and I'm uh, honoured to be asked to just open up. Um, I've been asked to address some technical issues, uh, what the situation is vis-a-vis -vis Iran's capability. Um, as you know, um, Iran has been enriching uranium and for the most part has been enriching uranium to... Um, less than 5%, that's called low enriched uranium. Um, according to the latest IAEA report, um, there's um, over 7,500 kilograms there. And um, they've also been enriching to less than 20%. Uh, that's um, still classified technically as low enriched uranium. 20% is the cutoff uh, for that classification. They've been enriching to just below that, um, some 230-odd kilograms, um, with quite a lot more, um, some, quite a lot of that in storage. Um, what does that mean? What, what does all this enrichment mean? Well, in order to um, use uranium uh, in most reactors, you need to enrich it to about 5%. That's the general rule. But for some reactors, particularly uh, for those producing um, medical isotopes or research reactors, you need it to be about 20%, and indeed, uh, or just under 20%. And indeed, Iran does have uh, the Tehran research reactor that does produce important medical isotopes. And it's re Iran's stated intention that this material would be used in that research reactor. Now, whether they're producing more than enough whether they intend to produce more than they require is one of the big questions that we have. However, and this is a really important thing to understand, the enrichment of uranium is such that it isn't a linear process. So if we're going from 5% to 20%, and then the next step up to 90%, which can be used for weapons, is not an equal uh, step, number of steps in terms of time and effort. Uh, the effort it takes to enrich to 5% is quite high compared with the next steps up to 20 and then 90. So it isn't as if we've got a linear progression in which, oh, they've done 5% and then 20% and then it's a long step up to 90. It's not like that at all. It's a curve that looks like a hockey stick. It goes up very dramatically, very quickly. 
Um, so enriching to just below 20% has done the large share of the work that would take to get to 90%. Now, having said that, all of those kilograms, of course, would shrink down quite a bit. And um, the IAEA has 25 kilograms of high enriched uranium uh, that they have as what they call their significant quantity for uh, nuclear weapons. And Iran is nowhere near that as yet. But they certainly would be able to uh, within a fairly short period of time. And that's one thing that is under great debate at the moment. So what does it mean? Does it mean that if they've gone up to 20% can easily get to 90% so that that means that they are determined to develop nuclear weapons? That may not be the case. Does it mean that they may have the full capability and remain ambivalent or remain on the, sh on the hedge, as it were, on the fence? That's a possibility. Does it mean that they want the capability with options for later? Or does it mean that they just want the technical capability to demonstrate to themselves that they can do it, and perhaps to their neighbors and others, but then not do it at all? And I think these are all very important questions that we need to retain in our heads, because technically, each one of those is quite possible at the stage that they're at now. And I think we tend to rush to judgment uh, because we imagine what we would do in those circumstances. But the questions we do have is why go down this route of enrichment? Why would you do that when there is already enriched material that you can buy? Is it available for Iran to buy? That's a question I think the Iranians would have. Certainly from their past experience, it might not have been so easy. Um, is it something that uh, could be provided in the future for Iran? And why develop so many centrifuges that are now in position to step up and ramp up the production if you're not going down the nuclear weapons route. Because the amount that would be provided for the research reactor would then be exceeded. So these are very big questions. The IAEA also has questions about some of the other facilities, and particularly the facility at Parchin, um, in which they say that there may have been military activities connected with the nuclear program. Uh, since 2003 is their question. In 2003, um, the general sense from intelligence agencies were, was that Iran had stopped its military activities in this sphere. However, there are some big questions left, and the IAEA has wanted to go in to look at Parchin. Uh, Iran says, sorry, Iran says uh, that they, this is a military base, and the IAEA has no business being there, and I will leave that to Hussein Musavian to address. But again, these are very big questions that they have. Um, and Iran is not yet implementing the additional protocol, which is something uh, that we need to be concerned about. Um, all countries should be implementing the additional protocol, uh, which gives the IAEA information and access that they require to verify that all the activities would be peaceful. So... <laughs> We have been, for quite a while now, at an impasse. The um, IAEA refers not only to its own resolutions in the Board of Governors, but also to UN Security Council resolutions. And Iran refers to the Non-Proliferation Treaty and the right to develop peaceful uses of nuclear energy. And we seem to be stuck in that. Talks go on. Um, we have now heard about the talks that will take place on the 25th of February. Um, what are the possible sanctions? What are the possible frameworks? Is there a regional framework that could be devised, such as the nuclear weapons free zone in the region that um, is on the cards at the moment in the international sphere? Do we carry down along the EU 3 plus 3 talks with Iran? Or is there a new approach that could be taken? And I, for one, look forward very much to what Hussein Musavian is going to say. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this event is on the record and is being uh, live streamed. Uh, Hussein Musavian is an associate research scholar at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. From 1997 to 2005, he was the head of the Foreign Relations Committee 
of Iran's National Security Council. And from 2003 to 2005, uh, when I was in Tehran as ambassador, he served as spokesman for Iran in its international nuclear negotiations with the European Union. Somebody, therefore, whom I had the honor and pleasure of calling on to try and bridge some of the gaps that existed then. He's author of The Iranian Nuclear Crisis, a memoir published by Carnegie in June last year. So, Hussein, we're very pleased to have you. It's an honor for me to be here today with you, all distinguished guests. I would like to thank Patricia, Richard, for invitation and arranging this event. Uh, you all know it's not sacred. The uh, EU 3 plus 3 policy of our Iranian nuclear dilemma has been a negotiation while escalating pressures, covert actions, cyber war, and economic warfare against Iran. In my understanding, maybe this, has, this policy ha has absorbed 95% of EU 3 plus 3 potential, focusing on pressures and sanctions rather than diplomacy. <clears throat> but it's interesting that both parties, they believe uh, uh, their policy has been successful. The, 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 the West claims victory because of impose, uh, imposing the most crippling sanctions ever on a country after Iraq during 1991 to 2003, which killed uh, about one million. And also, in their mindset, Western countries, they believe they are getting closer to uh, the ultimate goal, at least of the US, for regime change. Iranians also, uh, they claim victory because of imposing, uh, because uh, in response to sanctions, they have uh, developed uh, uh, their nuclear uh, facilities technology uh, in a way that today perhaps they have all nuclear technology uh, in their hand, from mining to uh, conversion to uh, new centrifuges, to uh, 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 enriching to 20%, which, as Patricia said, uh, they can go easily to 60% to 90%, and producing heavy water and uh, constructing heavy water reactors, everything they have. Uh, but I believe this is not difficult to uh, uh, predict the end state of such a duel could be confrontation, and most probably would be confrontation if the, both parties they continue current policy. Uh, I believe a, a war, the other options, uh, I mean, we have uh, war option, we have uh, pressures and sanctions, and we have diplomacy option. Uh, I have no doubt war would be disastrous for Iran, for Europe, for U.S., for region, and beyond. And I believe also this is a, a dangerous delusion to believe that sanctions, even the most crippling sanctions, will compel Iran to surrender on uh, its nuclear program or would lead to regime change. <clears throat> Both parties, they blame each other. You have heard a lot, either uh, on playing for the time or being too uh, internally disputed. That's why uh, I want to uh, present to you my own understanding about the, uh, the, the reality of uh, the current status quo of nuclear negotiations. Uh, the EU 3 plus 3, or P5 plus 1, the world powers, they have five major demands. The first one is to implement, Iran to implement additional protocol, which would give uh, 
much more intrusive inspection to the IAEA. The second is for Iran to implement the subsidiary arrangement code 3.1, which would give uh, much more transparency. The third is to address the IAEA's possible military dimension issues known as PMD, which would require Iran to uh, give access beyond additional protocol. Legally, internationally, we don't have anything beyond additional protocol, any arrangement. But for Iran to address possible military dimension issues, they would have to give access beyond additional protocol. <clears throat> Number four is to stop 20% enrichment, to cap at 5%. And number five is limit on uh, the stockpile of enrichment. Iranians, they also have two major demands. Recognition of Iranian, uh, Iranian uh, rights for enrichment on their NPT, non-proliferation treaty, like other member states of NPT, and lifting the sanctions even gradually. Iran is ready for a big deal on nuclear dilemma if all five plus two are considered within a package to be implemented step by step with proportionate reciprocations. But this, as far as I understand, this is what the P5 plus one or EU3 plus three, they are not prepared for such a deal. The first reason is, I believe, uh, due to sustained and increased pressure from Congress, APAC, Israel, President Obama is not prepared for, to make official declaration on recognition of Iran's right on their NPT for enrichment. The second is some European countries like France, they follow uh, the same uh, US policy on recognition of uh, the rights of Iran. <clears throat> the third, neither EU nor the US, they are not prepared to uh, uh, lift uh, substantive sanctions at all. They are negotiating with Iran with very uh, low-level sanctions, neither important multilateral sanctions nor important unilateral sanctions. They are not ready to deal. And reason number four is uh, EU position. The time we were negotiating uh, with EU3 uh, and before, EU used to have over 50% of uh, Iran's trade. This was a real leverage for EU to negotiate with Iran on every issue, not only the nuclear. Nowadays, I believe due to sanction policies, the EU has lost its position on trade with Iran. Maybe they have uh, less than 20% share. And the share of Iran's trade has gone to Asia, China, India, Russia, maybe about 80%. And the second uh, uh, issue about EU position was uh, that from Iranian point of view, EU was considered an impartial, relatively impartial arbitrator balancing uh, radical policies of Washington. They had more a balancing role between Iran and the US. And these days they have lost this role and even sometimes they are more Catholic than Pope. And number five reason is Obama has no authority to lift the sanctions. The US nuclear negotiation team is coming to negotiations with no authority. Because this is the Congress has authority to decide on lifting the sanctions, not the president. And Number six, which, is, which to me is the most important, is 
hostilities between Iran and the U.S. And I believe as long as these hostilities continue, I'm not optimistic whether we would be able to find uh, ultimately a peaceful solution uh, on nuclear issue. Because of these six reasons, I believe in past negotiations during 2012, the EU has uh, proposed its own very naive packages, asking for maximum. And in return, they have offered very minimum. Because they cannot go forward on two substantive demands of Iran, while Iran is prepared to make a deal for on five uh, demands of the P5. Solution is here. I believe uh, Europe, the US, they should be courageous enough to uh, bring all five major demands of uh, the P5 and two major demands of Iranian within a package. And they define how this could uh, proceed step by step with a timetable, with a realistic uh, proportionate reciprocations, not to ask in the first step the maximum from Iran and to give the minimum. But in parallel, I believe we need a direct talks between Iran and the US. I mean, on the nuclear issue, uh, this should be dealt within the P5 plus one. As long as we don't have in parallel a direct talk between Iran and the US, I'm afraid P5 would fail on the nuclear deal. Iranians and Americans, they need a direct talk on broader issues, bilaterally, regionally, internationally, a comprehensive package. To make such a deal possible, I believe the US as a world power and Iran as a regional power, they need to acknowledge, recognize their respective rights, interests. Otherwise, we are not going to get to anywhere. To the best of my knowledge, Iranians, they are prepared for a deal with the US based on mutual respect, non-interference, and equality. Up to now, the US has not been prepared. But the question is whether President Obama having uh, John Kerry and Chuck Hagel on board would be uh, courageous enough to make such a deal or not, we have to wait maybe for another year. I stop here. I prefer to uh, leave the time for the audience for questions and answers. <laughs>